What did you think of yourself as an assassin? Assassin? Sounds so exotic. <laughs> Some of the most prolific serial killers of recent years have had their confessions caught on tape thanks to court cameras. What do these horrible individuals have to say after committing unspeakable crimes against humanity? Let's dive right in and find out. Number 5. The Golden State Killer Joseph D'Angelo's confession must have been a relief to all the officers and detectives that worked his case. After all, he is the notorious Golden State Killer that eluded authorities for more than four decades. While some would expect a monster in handcuffs, Joseph James D'Angelo was a seemingly ordinary former police officer living near Sacramento until 2018, when he was charged with unspeakable crimes. The 74-year-old was described by former co-workers as a regular Joe, despite his serious demeanor and non-existent smile, yet he committed more than 50 rapes and 12 murders across California throughout the 1970s and 1980s. It took over 40 years to convict Joseph D'Angelo of these crimes, but police finally got their man. On June 29, 2020, Joseph D'Angelo pleaded guilty to 26 charges in a raping and killing spree. He was ultimately charged with 13 counts of murder, with additional special circumstances, as well as 13 counts of kidnapping for robbery. Although the COVID-19 pandemic delayed the preliminary hearing, the Golden State Killer trial eventually moved forward, and D'Angelo pleaded guilty to the 13 counts of murder as well as 13 counts of kidnapping. Although the statute of limitations for the many rapes he's accused of have expired, he received 11 consecutive life sentences for the crimes he did admit to, plus an additional life sentence and a further eight years, ensuring that he'll eventually die in prison. Let's hear what D'Angelo had to say at his trial. Survivors have spoken clearly. The defendant deserves no mercy. I've listened to all your statements, each one of them, and I'm truly sorry to everyone I've heard. Thank you, Your Honor. Number 4. The Iceman Richard Kuklinski became known as the Iceman, the Polish Mafia hitman who killed over 100 people by the time he was apprehended in 1986. He was possibly prolific serial killer, hitman, poisoner, and gangster. Kuklinski was born in Jersey City, New Jersey in 1935 to abusive parents Stanley and Anna Kuklinski. His younger brother Joseph was convicted of raping and killing a 12-year-old girl as an adult and died in 2003 after spending almost 30 years in prison while his older brother was beaten to death by his father. At the age of 10, Richard started torturing animals and would fantasize about killing his father. He was known to tie cats together by their tails, throw them over clothing lines, and watch them tear each other apart. At the age of 14, he committed his first known murder, beating Charlie Chase, the leader of a teenage gang, to death. He then attacked the six other gang members, almost killing all of them. This was just the start of a long life of murdering and killing for the Iceman. In 1986, Kuklinski was arrested after buying fake cyanide, which was to be used to kill someone that had a hit ordered on him. Recorded conversations of the murders he had committed led to charges of murder, attempted murder, firearms violations, robbery, and attempted robbery, and was indicted for five murders to which he had been tied. He was sentenced to two consecutive life sentences and served them in the Trenton State Prison, where his brother was already serving his own life sentence. He spent the remainder of his life there and was interviewed on multiple occasions, twice for HBO documentaries. On March 5, 2006, Kuklinski died from Kawasaki disease at the age of 70 in a secure wing of the St. Francis Medical Center. I was just a murderer. These guys watch too many movies. I shot George Malvin five times. Uh, Louis Masgay on July 1st, 1981, shot him once in the back of the head. It was due to business. Number 3. The Milwaukee Cannibal Jeffrey Dahmer was an American serial killer who took the lives of 17 males between 1978 and 1991. Over the course of more than 13 years, Dahmer sought out men, mostly African American, at gay bars, malls, and bus stops, lured them home with promises of money or sex, and gave them alcohol laced with drugs before strangling them to death. He would then engage in sex acts with the corpses before dismembering them and disposing of them, often keeping their skulls or genitals as souvenirs. He frequently took photos of his victims at various stages of the murder process so he could recollect each act afterward and relive the experience. Dahmer claims that his compulsions toward necrophilia and murder began around the age of 14. He was arrested in 1986 when two boys accused him of debating in front of them. He received a one-year probationary sentence. Dahmer's trial began in 1992 and he initially pleaded not guilty to all charges, despite having confessed to the killings during police interrogation. He eventually changed his plea to guilty by virtue of insanity. 
His defense then offered the gruesome details of his behavior as proof that only someone insane could commit such terrible acts. The jury chose to believe the prosecution's assertion that Dahmer was fully aware that his acts were evil and chose to commit them anyway. They gave the verdict and found him guilty, but sane, on all counts, Dahmer was captured in 1991 and sentenced to 16 life terms. He was killed by fellow prison inmate Christopher Scarver in 1994. Interviews with the prolific serial killer gave an eerie view into his cold, calculating, and disturbed mind. My parents, my relatives, had no knowledge of what I was doing. They're absolutely not responsible for any of it in any way. I, I can see why he'd wonder about those things, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, they're all excuses. So I, I alone am the one who's responsible for what's happened. It's a process that doesn't happen overnight. Depersonalize another person and view them as uh, an object for pleasure instead of a, a living, breathing human being. I always knew that, that it was wrong, but uh, and uh, taking him back to the house and uh, having complete control and dominance over him. Number two, the Florida Highway Killer. Female serial killers surface less frequently than males, and Eileen Wernos can easily be considered history's most terrifying female serial killer. After a childhood of abuse and abandonment, Eileen Wernos went on a killing rampage that left at least seven men dead across Florida in 1989 and 1990. In 2002, the state of Florida executed the 10th woman to ever receive the death penalty in the U.S. since the 1976 reinstatement of capital punishment. That woman's name was Eileen Warnos, a former sex worker who had killed seven men she picked up while working the highways of Florida. Her life later became the subject of screenplays, stage productions, and multiple documentaries, as well as the basis for the 2003 movie Monster. The terrible events of her upbringing likely set Wuornos on a path to becoming one of history's most terrifying serial killers. Eileen Wuornos' father committed suicide while her mother abandoned her, leaving her in the care of paternal grandparents. Tylea Moore, Eileen's former lover and an accomplice in some of the crimes, eventually became the reason she ended up getting caught. Eileen Wuornos went on trial for the murder of Richard Mallory on January 16, 1992, and was convicted two weeks later. The sentence was death. Around a month after, she pleaded no contest to three more murders, for which the sentences were also death. In 1992, Wuornos pled guilty to the murder of Charles Karskadden and was given yet another death sentence. On June 6, 2002, Eileen Wuornos was put to death. Lee, it sounds like you've been betrayed by everyone. That's right, I was. Just shot and self boom, 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 you know. They weren't cut up, they weren't sliced up, no OJ jazz, you know. And he said, I did the most horrendous crime in the whole wide world. If it was a horrendous crime, why didn't I shoot him between the eyes? All kinds of gross stuff. All they were was shot and left. Sitting on the floor watching TV, and she just come out and said, I have something to tell you. And she said that she had shot and killed a man that day. You guys got it. Sam, turn and tell you, man, they lied. They lied so bad to you all. And, it, and, and that's a hell of a lot of men I went through before the next jerk came along and I used to protection. Number one, the co-ed killer. Known as the co-ed killer, Edmund Kemper brutally murdered at least 10 people in California during the 1960s and 70s. The signs were there from the beginning. As a boy, Edmund Kemper killed animals, decapitated his sister's dolls, and invented disgusting games. But when Kemper later confessed to killing six female hitchhikers, as well as his mother and her best friend, the police didn't believe him at first. They knew and liked Big Ed, the six foot nine man who seemed like a gentle giant. In truth, he was anything but. His high IQ of 145 only made him more dangerous, as he used his intelligence to slip away from his crime scenes undetected. Edmund Kemper developed dark fantasies at a young age, which soon escalated to real violence. In his adult life, the co-ed killer began cruising the Pacific Coast area in search of female hitchhikers, all the while gathering kill supplies such as a knife, plastic bags, and handcuffs. In 1972, he committed his first two murders as a serial killer. Over the following nine months, he killed four more women. On April 19, 1973, he bludgeoned his mother to death in her sleep and did horrific things to her corpse. Kemper ended up calling the police from a phone booth, confessing to all of his murders. I'm someone who has been a murderer for almost 20 years. My gun was under the seat. What in the hell am I doing telling you that? It was raging inside. There was just incredible energies positive and negative, that would trigger one or the other. People weren't even aware of what was happening. 
I was also involved in killing co-eds because my mother was associated with college work, college co-eds, uh, a failed marriage with my father. I'm a constant reminder of that failure. That's all for this video, folks. See you another time.